morning, everyone. Have just a couple of quick announcements. Um, we talked last week about, and in the newsletter, about the baby bottle boomerang that didn't happen. It usually is between Mother's Day and Father's Day, and uh, a lot of churches weren't meeting at that time. So um, we have this big five-gallon bottle up here. They didn't want to uh, have to worry about everybody bringing bottles back and forth, and so we just have this, and you can put change in there. Um, and you can, or you can write a check, but be sure you make it out to the uh, Pregnancy Help Center if you write a check. And um, they take dollar bills, whatever you want to put in there, they will, they will get it out of there. <laughs> that looks like a baby Huey bottle. Yeah. So, the yeah. Young people don't know who I baby Huey had is. Made it look like a baby bottle. But anyway, that's what that's for. And also, uh, September's the month for the Mary Hill Davis uh, State Missions Offering for Texas. And if you'd like to make. Um, an envelope for that. We have some up there on both of these uh, corners by the plate. There's some of those envelopes uh, special. And if you don't have one of those, you can just write on your check, Mary Hill Davis, and it'll get to the right place. And I think there are some in the foyer as well, some of those envelopes. You want to talk about next week? Next week, I uh, hope you got your email f uh, about a Sunday school, but we're going to uh, try to start Sunday school back up for all the ages next Sunday at 9.30. So we have 30 more minutes before you had to come today. 9.30 for Sunday school in all the classes, and uh, then church will start at 10.30. And that will uh, still give Warren time to upload the service for those who, uh, it'll be a little later, but they'll get it. They'll get it online so that they can watch the ones that are still uh, feeling like they need to be at home. So if you see somebody that you think might not have, got, have gotten that message, maybe they don't have email or whatever, please let them know uh, that, ne that next Sunday's the day. Also, we'll be doing the Lord's Supper in a different way. And uh, when you come in, we'll have um, baskets or something with the elements in it individually packed. And you can just pick that up yourself instead of having to uh, pass it out. And we'll be celebrating that next Sunday. And also, if people are not... Or our hi Facebook people, I'm waving at you. Okay. If you're out there and you want to take it at home, we'll have that up here for you. You just come pick it up this week. We'll have it in little bags by probably Tuesday or whatever. Mm -hmm. Some of them ready to, to pick up and okay. do that with. And uh, you don't talk about Max or anything. The Max, you don't want to. <laughs> you don't like Max. <laughs> what don't you like about? Him? No, what do you want to say? What do you want to say? I don't know. <laughs> well, I can't remember. I'll say the wrong thing. No, you know, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, we have talked about masks, and we wrote it in the newsletter about wearing masks. I know that some may not be comfortable for very long with your mask on, so um, I know that a lot of you have been doing this. You just wear your mask in the aisles. And then next, and then you sit, when you sit down and take it off, which is fine. That's why we have these rows apart like that. So that's fine. And in the hallways next Sunday, if you'll do that, um, if you're if people in your class are okay with not wearing them, and or you can spread out, then that's fine. You don't have to wear them in your in your room. Children and the children. Um, we talked about that some more um, in our staff meeting, and we decided that um, since. It's hard for kids to keep them on that long that they don't have to wear them. Is that correct? That's, I think, That's what, what we talked we about again. Okay. Everything that we decide can it, be it, changed it in keeps, a heartbeat. It keeps changing. So. And we um, have another storm in the go. The thing is, we want everyone to be comfortable it's coming wonderful. and worshiping, and, um, and, and we want to stay safe. So we're going to do everything we can to have the rooms all uh, clean uh, for you all that next week, and we'll see how everything goes next Sunday. And... Uh, Again, if you uh, see anybody uh, or you talk to anybody on the phone who you think might not know that we're having Sunday school next week, please let them know. And that worships at 1030. Okay, I'm going to read the scripture now. That's fine. Okay. Would you please stand? I'm going to read uh, from Psalm 91 and then from Habakkuk 3. I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart. I will tell of all your wonderful deeds. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing the praises of your name, O Most High. The Lord reigns forever. He has established his throne for judgment. He rules the world in righteousness and judges the peoples with equity. 
The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a stronghold in times of trouble. Those who know your name trust in you, for you, Lord, have never forsaken those who seek you. Though the fig tree does not bud and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. And if you'll remain standing, we're going to sing to God be the glory. Blessed be your glorious 
Blessed be your name. Blessed be the name. your name this morning and we thank you for the opportunity that we have to come and, and worship you in, in spirit and truth and we come to be able to share with each other the things that uh, that, that you give us Lord the, your joy, your hope your peace during times of hard times and Father, we just love you. We thank you that you're big enough to handle whatever problems, whatever's going on. And Father, help us not be lax in, in giving you the praise and the thanksgiving for everything that you've done in our lives, Lord. Today, as we worship you, I pray that you would just uh, pour down your spirit upon this congregation. And, and we thank you that, that next week we'll be able to meet back again uh, in, in Bible studies and different activities and we thank you uh, right now that uh, you're providing a, a, an end it looks like to this uh, pandemic that's going on and I pray for the people that, that still have it even people here in town that, that have gotten it and getting better and you're providing healing for them every day and I thank you for that Lord and Father just help us to uh, take care of those folks the best that we can and and for the folks that are going through other changes in life and illness and different things, I pray that you'd just give them your peace. Show them your love, Lord. Help them rely on you more and more and more each day. Because we need to rejoice in you, Lord. And we need to trust you in every aspect of our lives and be satisfied with with what you have for us, Lord. Help, help us to be joyful, leave a joyful, thankful life, even during times of adversity. And thank you for that, that you've taken care of us through this, this time, Lord. We just thank you so much for that. Be with us this morning as we, as we hear your word, as we continue to sing, as we uh, listen to what you would have us to hear this morning. Open our eyes, open our ears to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> that for 
quite a bit this morning. We will be in uh, Mark chapter 7. We finished up chapter 6 last time. So today uh, we have some fun things to discuss. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, rules, sanitation, and mask wearers. Doesn't that sound uh, appropriate for our times? Um, the Bible has quite a bit to say about all those things, um, so we will dig into that. So if you have your Bible open, we're going to begin here, starting in verse 1 of chapter 7. Now when the Pharisees gathered to him, with some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem, they saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they came from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. And the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? And he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites, as it is written? This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, you have, a, you have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you have gained from me is korban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down. And many such things you do. That's a nice ending there. Uh, is the pulpit mic on? I'm just going to swap over to that because I think I got some feedback happening. Can you hear me okay? No. No. Is the pulpit on? No? Okay. Yes? No? People in the front say yes. People in the back are like, what's going on? Oh, there it is. Okay. Yeah, John's doing the up-down over here. Back over there. Uh, so, this morning, we have a very interesting, peculiar text before us. And as we know, we've been going through this gospel. And recently, it's been kind of the, the you know, not the who's who of preachers, but the, the what's what of sermons that's kind of been happening lately. Well, which sermon is it today? Is it... Jesus feeds the 5,000, or he walks on the water, or he tells the hypocrites uh, that they're hypocrites. And that's kind of been the popular sermons. If you go to any church for any extended period of time, there's a pretty good chance you're going to run into these sermons at some point. Uh, but what we do know in the Gospel of Mark is that Jesus is just now getting to where he's finishing up. Man, I feel like I can talk so much better now. I don't have that ringing in my ear. Uh, <laughs> Now I'm going to go 100 miles an hour. <laughs> Jesus is finishing up his Galilean ministry. So he's in the Galilean area. He's going about healing people, casting out demons, saying the kingdom of God is here. He feeds uh, the 5,000 plus, who knows how many. Uh, and what happened, which is very interesting, is the next day they really liked that he fed their bellies. So he, they came to him because they wanted to make him king. And they said, hey, you fed us dinner last night. Why don't you feed us some breakfast this morning? And Jesus said, well, I'm not here to fill your bellies. I'm, I'm here actually not to just give you bread, but I'm the bread of life. I can give you something that can sustain you past just one meal. And it turns out that many people didn't like it, and they turned away and left. And even some of his disciples, not necessarily the 12, but these other core followers that were with him, did not like it either. And they turned away and left themselves. So now what we have here at the beginning of chapter 7 is some religious officials from Jerusalem coming to check in on Jesus. Uh, if you've read Mark's gospel, you'll know in chapter 3, uh, some people who don't necessarily like each other, these scribes and Pharisees, teamed up with some of the Herodians. 
to plot out to kill Jesus because of his message, because what he was doing and the following he was gaining. So you'll see from this that Jesus kind of gives them a rebuke uh, for what they're thinking and what they say. And do not be so quick to say, oh, maybe those poor scribes and Pharisees, maybe they just weren't aware. Maybe they were just ignorant of what Jesus was saying. Why was Jesus so stern with them? Well, I'll share with you here from later on in Mark, chapter 12, in verse 28, we have the great commandment that many of us know. This is actually right at the very end before Jesus is crucified. He's going to be questioned by all these officials. And he says, And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another, and seeing that he answered them well, asked him, Which commandment is the most important of all? And Jesus answered, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. I w wouldn't you like to be able to look at Jesus and go, hey, you're right. Good answer, teacher. Good answer, teacher. Because you have truly said that he is one and that there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself. Now catch this. This is the scribe saying this. Is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. I don't know if it's up there. Oh, yeah, it is up there. It's one of my favorite little things added to the end of any section. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. <laughs> Gotta love it. But this little example that we just read is actually a very rare instance of a very rare scribe. Um, this is someone whose heart is in the right place and recognizes love of God and love of other trumps all these other regulations and rules that we have put in place because if we obey them simply for the rule's sake rather than for the heart of God and the heart of fellow man's sake, we have distorted the truth for our own purposes, and it is but filthy rags before God. It is not true worship. And we see actually in Matthew's version, 23, he gives some very bad woes, or what they call in the Bible, where he condemns the Pharisees and the hypocrites for uh, and these scribes for saying one thing and doing another. Luckily for us, no one does that today. <laughs> but he gave these seven woes to these scribes and Pharisees. So that's who we have at hand today, the scribes and Pharisees. So what's the problem at hand that we have presented to us? Starting back in verse 2 of Mark 7, it says, They, these people, saw that some of his disciples ate with hands that were defiled, that is, unwashed. So he's not saying that they ate with dirty hands, which maybe even some of us do still today, which isn't probably very good. You could probably take some tips from some of us who like to educate others on, hey, it's good to clean your hands or use germ germix or what have you, but some of us, maybe men or boys, are stubborn sometimes on that. So he said uh, some of the disciples, though, had ate without ceremonially clean hands. Not necessarily dirty hands, but unwashed hands. So he said some of the disciples, so that means one or two things. That it either means that all the disciples were there, some of them obeyed and some of them didn't obey. Uh, or not all the disciples were there. And these were the sum, and they didn't obey these traditions that these scribes had. Either way, I don't know which one. Pick whichever is your fancy, and we'll roll on to the meaning of the text. The traditions here um, is important for us to figure out that if they are not commanded in Scripture, or if they're not in conflict with Scripture, they may be permissible, but they should not be an obligation. I'll say that again. If there's a command given from a tradition that's not found in Scripture or in conflict with Scripture, 
It may be okay to do it, but it shouldn't be mandated that you do it. So, for example, if you want to exchange wedding rings up here for a religious wedding ceremony, it's completely okay to do it. Search your Bibles all you want. I don't know if you'll find that happening, but it's permissible. It's not obligatory. Men, if you're going to get married, I wouldn't suggest telling your future wife, hey, we shouldn't do wedding, wedding rings. That may not go over so well. But nonetheless, there's no command that thou shalt put a ring on it, as Beyonce said. Sorry. <laughs> Another example is giving a public testimony, maybe before you become baptized before everyone. Getting up and giving a full speech. Some of us, that would frighten us. <laughs> Including me, hard to believe. <laughs> to get up and just ramble on about your life, but about what God has done. That's the part I can talk about. The other stuff is hard. Uh, you won't find a command that you cannot be baptized unless you give such a public testimony. Uh, but it's permissible if that's what you wish to do. But to make it obligatory to be in right standing with God, you will be hard-pressed to find that written out for us in scripture and in the same way Jesus is challenging these scribes and Pharisees saying this tradition that you have it may be okay it may not conflict with scripture it may be a good thing even uh, but it is optional it is not obligatory and this is not the first time that these such people tried to trap Jesus in chapter 2 of Mark it was on the Sabbath and he and his disciples were hungry out in the field, and they picked some things off the grain, uh, some grain off the, off the wheat field or wherever they were. Uh, and the religious official said, you know, it's a Sabbath. You're not supposed to do that. And he said to them, well, the Sabbath wasn't made for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. Man is not made simply just to live and do all the rules and not be concerned with anyone's heart. But rather, the rules should be concerned about people's heart in helping that situation. So we see here in chapter 3 that then now they wanted to kill him. And now here in verse 3 of chapter 7 we get some kind of parenthetical note, some kind of aside to let you know what this hand washing business is all about. Remember Mark is writing to a predominantly Gentile Roman audience and they're going to hear about well, what's this whole deal with washing hands? It doesn't make sense. So he goes on to explain for the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands properly, holding to the tradition of the elders. And when they come from the marketplace, they do not eat unless they wash. And there are many other traditions that they observe, such as the washing of cups and pots and copper vessels and dining couches. Well, that's a lot of things to wash. So we see this term that pops up in this section over and over again called the tradition of the elders. Well, what is that? What does all this mean? Well, once Moses came down from Mount Sinai, we had the law. Uh, we had the Ten Commandments, and Moses compiles together the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. That is the written law, but you also have an oral law or an interpretation of it that is going around in the community that people are remembering. It's how uh, we do something very similar today. We we think that sometimes we're just reading God's word, but we often give our interpretation of it. And it may not line up with actually what the words are saying. And in the same way, these people had an oral interpretation, and they would pass it on. Uh, Josephus, who is a historian and a contemporary of Jesus, said the Pharisees had delivered to the people a great many observances that were not written in the book of Moses. So there was a lot of other conversation being had of religious matters. And it's important here uh, that these interpretations became to be regarded as of equal importance as Scripture. This is the folly of these scribes and Pharisees. They began to put a fence around the law. They did not want to mess up God's word, so they put another boundary there. Then they made everybody obey by that boundary. This started back in the Old Testament when Ezra came back from the exile and they are rebuilding and uh, reteaching the law to people and all these scribes all of a sudden started adding to God's law if this tickles your fancy at all and you don't know more about it you can go google up uh, the Mishnah uh, which is the collection of this oral law 
Uh, and that word just simply means to repeat. Uh, it was an interpretation of the law. And by the way, there were 30 chapters about cleaning pots and pans. So if you want to know, maybe if your pots or pans are clean at home, this is good napping material for you. <laughs> so the Mishnah needed clarity as well because, oh, I can't understand that. That's a lot of writing. So then they came up with a commentary for it called the Gemara, which means complete. That's good. We don't need anything else, right? We got, we got the repeat and the complete. Nothing else we need. Except then they put them together and they called it the Talmud. So that was a Talmud. And then if you're a Babylonian, you had a big Talmud because it was four times bigger than the other one. Why? Because people love to make rules. They love to make laws. I think someone said once it's people love, they would rather make ten more laws than take away one. For some reason, we like making rules and laws and making other people mainly obey them. When we feel like it, we may obey them. But mainly it's for the other people's sake. Then here in verse 5 it says, and the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders? So there's that phrase again. But eat with defiled hands. So God gave a, a straightforward explanation to the priests in Exodus chapter 30, you can go read, about how they should partake in these kind of hand-washing ceremonies and cleansing. But, you know, if you're a good religious person, you go, oh, well, if the most holy of us, the priests, are supposed to do this, well, then that must be beneficial and right for everyone to have to do this as well. So they made an additional law that not only must priests obey, but all must obey. Their additions and misinterpretations began to take on the status of law itself in their community. And this is not an ancient problem, which is what we're going to discuss today. This is not an ancient problem. But rather, this is a recurring issue that we have each and every generation that walks on this earth. Now, we must be able to determine the difference between human and tradition and scripture and what is divine, what is of God. We must make sure that we don't make the obligatory optional nor the optional obligatory. We have to make sure we get these right, or else we may find ourselves on the wrong side of a rebuke from Jesus. Which brings me to this, that the compassionate Jesus that we often see towards the crowd can also be a very condemning Jesus towards those that twist his words. And I love how Matthew puts this in Matthew's version, uh, Matthew 15, 2 and 3. Uh, they ask him, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? And Jesus immediately comes back and says, and why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? Oh, Jesus. Sassy. <laughs> right back at him. You know? That, that's kind of interesting. He answers their question with a the question. They try to poke it their heart, and Jesus pokes it their heart. Well, who knows whose heart better? That's what we're dealing with Jesus' team. So this is a stinging rebuke from Jesus. And he's often full of mercy and grace for those who are far from the kingdom. But those who are close and are twisting his words, he's often very stern with them. And he says this in verse 6, and he said to them, Well, did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites as it is written? Don't you just love that? You're just talking to somebody. Yeah, you asked that question? Yeah, Isaiah said something about you being hypocritical. Let me, let me pull it up and let me read it to you. He said, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. Now I want you to pick this up. It's never one of those things. It's always both of those things. People don't simply just say, when their hearts are far, far from God, well, I hold to my tradition and I stay with God's commandments. But it's always, well, God's commandment isn't that important. 
in light of this more important human tradition that we have created. That takes a backseat to what is most important and in front of us today, which is something that we have created. The book of Isaiah also begins in chapter 1 with, with another warning to these hypocrites. In Isaiah 1, starting in verse 10, it says, Hear the word of the Lord, you rulers of Sodom. Give ears to the teaching of our God, you people of Gomorrah. We know those aren't good places. What to me is the multitude of your sacrifices, says the Lord? I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of well-fed beasts. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or of goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required of you this trampling of my courts? Now catch this verse. Bring no more vain offerings, incense as an abomination to me. He simply didn't say, don't bring me any offerings. He said, don't bring me any vain offerings. He continues, new moon and Sabbath and the calling of convocations. I cannot endure iniquity and solemn assembly. Your new moons and your appointed feast, my soul hates. Whoa, God hates something? That cannot be. There's very stark language here. They have become a burden to me, he continues. I am weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. Wash yourselves and make yourselves clean. Remove the evil of your deeds from before my eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Correct oppression. Bring justice to the fatherless and plead the widow's case. What he's saying here is you have speech that you talk about all the time about your formal beliefs. Put it aside because your hearts are terrible. What you need to do is align your hearts with what you're saying. So he gives them this list. Do these things that you often talk about because you often just speak of them and don't do them. And then verse 18, there's good news though. Even for the hypocrites. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall become like wool. Even if you have this terrible heart, simply come to God, and he can make you clean. He points out that the scribes and Pharisees, their religion is superficial, it's skin surface, and it's man made. Verse 8, you leave the commandment of God and you hold through to the tradition of men. So you may be saying, okay, Warren, I've gotten that point far enough. Thank you very much. How do I know if what I'm doing is right? How do I know if what I'm doing is from Scripture or my interpretation or some tradition that I've made up? Well, I'd simply say, well, take this and open it up and spend some time in it. That, that would help you out. Um, but we also need to often do a heart check with ourselves. We often need to go to God in prayer and say, God, have, have I been calloused about anything lately? Have, have I missed something? Have I been condemning and unloving towards others or anything of my attitude or my tone or my words or my actions or deeds? These are things of a repentant sinner, what they would ask before God to check their heart. Rather than saying, no, 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 I got it all figured out. I already know what's right, what's wrong, what's up, what's down, what's left, what's right. You don't need to tell me anything. I don't need to change anything in my life. That is very much like the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, we all think that we're healthy. We all think that we're in shape. We all think that there are no problems going on in our body until what? We go to a doctor visit and we step on the scale or they check our vital signs, or they run some blood test, and it comes up saying, have you been eating at the Bulldog every day? <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, well, no, well, maybe. <laughs> we like to kid ourselves a lot about things. That's one example. But we often like to kid ourselves about our own hearts. I'm not the problem. Other people are the problem. If other people would just fix themselves, we'd have a lot less problems. But we know that's not true. We know it's not true. 
we need to have some heart-checking moments going on. We make deductions often looking at people by what we see on the outside, but God is not fooled by that. He's not as concerned as much about my speech and me getting up here and speaking before you on Sunday mornings as he is about my motivation to want to get up here and speak to you. He's more concerned about the heart of the matter. And these Pharisees and scribes, they had it wrong because they cared a lot about their public performance and they perfected it, but their hearts were far from God. You know, the Pharisees, they, their external performance, they'll say, well, uh, man, look at that guy over there. You see how many times he recited that prayer or he read that book? Man, he must be really close to God. It's kind of like, uh, you know, if a coach uh, at a gym was to tell somebody, okay, here's what I want you to do. Go into the gym, pick up that 10-pound weight, and do it, the rep, 10 times. And he says, well, no, I'm going to go over there and pick up that 20-pound weight, and I'm going to do it 25 times. What's the point of that? To hopefully, maybe somebody's watching me, and they see how strong I am, to see what I'm doing. But the coach knows that's not what you need to do. Just listen to the coach. But we care a lot about outward performance. So, these religious people started paying attention to all these additional rules, and they smothered God's law with them, and they perverted and changed God's law. Now, I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm saying today. It's important for us to know that all rules and laws are not bad. Many will swing the pendulum the other way. Well, okay, I'm not about laws or rules or anything at all. Do whatever you want, whenever you want, as long as you love. I'm all about love, but no rules. Well, there's a problem with that, because we will self and say, well, Jesus got rid of the law. We don't need law. We don't need rules. Well, no, he didn't get rid of it. He didn't abolish it. He came and he fulfilled it. Amen. Law and love are not enemies. They're not enemies. They're meant to go hand in hand. The law oftentimes is a diagnostic and tells us of our wicked heart. And God's love is the remedy for our wicked heart. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Love of God manifests itself in obedience. They're not at war with one another. So, the Phariseeism thinking is, well, let's make these other rules, and if you do all them, you're probably good, you're probably okay. If you don't go to the dance hall, if you don't go watch these type of movies, if you uh, don't wear pants or dress leggings, I heard that was a big thing for y'all back in the day, uh, if, you, uh, if you don't dip, if you don't smoke, if you don't drink, then hey, you must be an A-OK -okay Christian. If you do any of those things, watch out. Man, salvation will be in jeopardy. The problem is, can't find that in the Bible. It may be permissible. It may be good for you not to do any of those things. But obligatory? Chapter and verse. Give me chapter and verse. This is false thinking. This false thinking is that a good God will reward religious people as long as they keep doing their best. And the only way to be good is to God is to keep doing those things. But you'll find out if you try doing those things, you can't do them very long before you can't do those things or you mess up those things. So the Pharisee tries to make the law that he can keep, and that will make him feel better, at least in comparison to others. If not, maybe before God himself, which they'll have a rude awakening one day. Think about this parable of the Pharisee that all of us know, Luke 18. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves, this is their folly, that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. You see that? It, it's always these things. It's never like, well, this guy was righteous. And he also treated others poorly. You see the problem when you see yourself as self-righteous? Verse 10, two men went up into the temple, Jesus loves to give these parables, to pray, and one of them a Pharisee and one a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector over here, buddy. <laughs> can you imagine if you were like that tax collector? I mean, your buddy's like, can you imagine if you're me right now? <laughs> Verse 12 says, I fast twi twice a week. I give tithes of all that I get. 
But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even lift up his eyes to heaven. But he beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Religious folk love a good parable like this. They don't like the ending. They like the setup in the beginning. Yeah, look at all these deeds I did. Look at how good I am in comparison to others. Who is the one that was righteous before God? From an external perspective, it may seem to be the one who prays well and does all these things and gives all his money and acts righteous, but really it's the other guy. The other guy who doesn't have anything but simply a prayer. Uh, maybe, the, uh, maybe the religious guy thinks, well, that's a poor prayer. It's very short. It's not very long. That won't go over well on Sunday morning. He won't be added back to the, to the set list. <laughs> that was a quick prayer, but he needed to fill three minutes, and he didn't do it. The tax collector isn't justified, though, because he's a sinner. For both of them are sinners. But he recognizes he has a helpless state and knows only God can save him from his predicament. The Pharisee appealed to justice based on his merit, which he didn't have, and the tax collector, collector admitted that he didn't have any merit, and he appealed simply on God's mercy alone. Well, the good news for you and I today is whether you're a tax collector or a Pharisee, God can change your heart. God can give you mercy and grace. And I think for these Pharisees that Jesus is so stern with, only God can change a rule-keeping Pharisee into a mercy-loving son or daughter of his. Let's finish up this section real quick in Mark. Jesus gives an example that exposes them. In verse 9 he says, And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. For Moses said, Honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if a man tells his father or his mother, whatever you would have gained from me is Corban, that is given to God, then you no longer permit him to do anything for his father or mother, thus making void the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and many such things you do. Many such things you do. So I, I like how in Mark's version here we have about for Moses says in verse 10, but you say. So he's contrasting these scribes and Pharisees with the great and mighty Moses. But Moses speaks for someone besides just Moses. Moses is speaking for God. And we know this in Matthew because Matthew says, for God said, but you say. In this same exact tone. Now, whether this is a moment of of devotion or rebellion, we don't know when it comes to this rule of Corbin. So essentially what was made was that if you wanted to devote something, uh, let's say, to the temple, uh, to the religious establishment, or to God himself, you could declare your assets and all that you have as being Corbin, meaning dedicated to God. That is what the term means. So let's say uh, I had, a, I don't know, an extra house or something, and I'm like, you know what, I don't really need that. Uh, I, I, I should give that to the, to the church. Maybe those resources could be used for God's kingdom in a much better fashion. I'm going to declare it Corbin. But this particular problem came up to where once something was declared Corbin, it could never be undeclared Corbin. Because it was a rule. It was a law that was made. Now, tell me in the Bible where you're going to find this. I don't know. Because this is one of those traditions of the elders type of things. And what would happen in such a situation if maybe someone said, I want to give some monetary value in my trust or my estate or whatever it may be to benefit God's kingdom in the church. And then what if that person had a drastic life change? What if that person got in a serious injury and couldn't care for themselves and needed those resources? Or better yet, what if someone's mother or father, who they already had plans to take care of, now all of a sudden they find themselves lacking these resources to take care of their mother or father, can't do it anymore, unless what they said that they were going to give to God at the end whenever, whenever they're passed on wasn't available for them to do it. Because these 
religious officials said, no, 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 you've already pledged that. It doesn't matter about you trying to care for your father or mother anymore with those resources. Those are already gone. And this is the problem that these people had that Jesus exposed for them. Saying, you don't care as much about caring for people as you do about keeping these rules and laws you are making up. I mean, I, I, I could just imagine if someone said, hey, I'm going to sell my truck and warm, and I'm going to give you all the money so that y'all could go on a mission trip. Well, that's awesome. That's cool. And then what if next week, you know, we have mission trips two months out. They said, my mother's in the hospital, and I don't have the funds. And because of COVID, I've been let off my job. And I've had to use this and use that to pay off debt. And I have no money. All I have is my truck. And I need to take care of my mother. And what if I said, well, I'm sorry. You've already given your truck to the church. This is what it would be like for these religious officials. You can't break the rules. You can't break the law. But where is that in God's word? You can't find it. And it reveals their heart. Now can you see why Jesus was so stern with these people? You may say, that sounds like a terrible thing. And it is. It's wicked. And many of us don't think it because many of us don't check our hearts. We need to have some hearts checked. So, in conclusion, some of us don't like God's word being the ultimate authority because that means we are not the ultimate authority. We don't like God being on the throne because we want to be on the throne. Some of us like creating extra rules because it makes ourselves feel like we have earned something and that we have some sort of righteous standing before God or even before our peers. And some of us don't like listening to God because that means we will have to obey his commands. And that means a change in our lives. But I want to remind you, love and law are not enemies. If we love God, we will follow his commands. And his greatest command is to love him and to love one another, regardless of each other's race, creed, culture, political persuasions, clothing choices, hand sanitizer or not, mask or not. We are called to love one another. Amen. So I tell you today, there's a lot of rules and regulations in our current climate. Some of them may be extremely beneficial. Some of them, maybe not. Either way, I hope that we wouldn't debate so much as, well, it's got to be this law, this law, this law, this law, versus, you know, I really care for my neighbor. I really care for their well-being. I really love them. So whatever that may mean I have to do, I will do, for I love my neighbor as I love myself. I'm going to live as Jesus lived, not demanding everyone has to do something that I sometimes may not do, but rather I will live in such a way that I will lay down my life. I will sacrifice things so that others may see God's love and God's mercy and God's grace. We have stubborn, hardened hearts. If you don't know that, go online today. And read the first thing you see. Actually, I encourage you not to. <laughs> right. Please don't do it. Please don't do it. We need to love each other better. We need that at any time. Not just this next month. Not just the next month and a half. However long it is till the day you know it's hovering over your head. But we need to love each other better. We don't need to be like these hypocrites. We don't need to even look down on them because you know what? As soon as we do, we start becoming them. So I hope this word takes seed in your heart today. And I hope that we can pray just like the tax collector. Let's do that right now. Father God, help us. Have mercy on us today. You're the only one who can fix these problems, God. Change our hearts. We love you. We pray for you. And we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for joining this morning.
in God's word and singing his praises to him. I need it every week. I need to see you every week. It encourages my heart. And I hope that God goes with you this week and that you share his kingdom message to this community. All right, we'll see you all next week.